Hi, I'm Dr. Ruth Goten, the Administrative Director of the Chima Institutional MD-PhD program, and today we have another conversation with an MD-PhD student in our program. Today we have Alexander Perez, or as we call him, Alex. Hi, Alex. <laughs> Grateful to be here. Great. Um, now, you are at the tail end of, your, of the program, the yep. sixth year now, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And you are defending in about three weeks, two yes, weeks? Yes, in about two and a half weeks. Yep. All right, we're yeah. pulling for you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I was hoping we can actually start from the beginning and you tell us just a little bit about yourself and how you chose MD-PhD. Absolutely. So uh, I originally was uh, just going to do a PhD. Mm -hmm. uh, med school was not something that was ever on my mind. Uh, and actually in college, I was grateful that I wasn't a pre-med because they seemed to be under so much stress. Uh, when I decided that I was going to do MD-PhD, I got all that stress at once. Uh, and so I definitely understand like that it is a lot of pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, what triggered me from PhD to MD-PhD is uh, back in, so I grew up uh, in California, in Colorado. Uh, one of my best friends is about 40 years my senior. She gave me my first job. Wow. Uh, and I, I worked with her for uh, all throughout high school and even parts of middle school, like helping her with like yard work and whatnot. Uh, over the course of a, my uh, the end of my tenure with her, uh, her husband came down with something that seemed like Parkinson's disease. Uh, and so the problem with the Parkinson's disease though was that it was way too aggressive to actually be Parkinson's and it didn't respond to Parkinson, to Parkinson treatment. Mm. And he actually ended up dying within a few months. Oh, wow. And on autopsy, it was found that he had something called MSA, multiple systems atrophy. And uh, the disease process was terrible, but actually seeing what his family went through and what happened with my friend, uh, that was heart-wrenching. And I realized that with a PhD, I might be able to make an impact, uh, but also seeing how powerless the doctors were with that diagnosis like really kind of shook me. Mm -hmm. uh, and I kind of uh, decided that probably the best way to actually help uh, forestay that type of experience for people was to have both, uh, be able to focus your research on issues that we're directly affecting people's lives, and a medical background is a perfect way to accomplish that. Mm -hmm. And so I switched from PhD to MD PhD. I think literally at the last possible second. Wow. Uh, and uh, I applied late in the process, I think, but fortunately things worked out. Wow. Yeah. I can see you getting very sad when you're talking about. Yeah, it's, it's a it's a little. I, I don't talk about it too often, but I think it's important uh, just knowing the backgrounds that people come from, yeah. uh, they go into MD, PhD. So that was your catalyst? Yes. Yeah. So what did you do um, once you entered an MD, PhD program? Did you ever, or is that the field that you're working in, or what did you decide to do? So uh, I changed my mind two weeks in about You going changed your mind a lot at the last minute. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, exactly. I, I changed my mind a ton at the last minute, so uh, that's okay. It ends up working well uh, most of the time. Sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe change your mind a little bit you know, early on. But for me, it, it worked out all right. Originally, I was coming in as a computational neuroscientist. Uh, in undergrad, I majored in computational biology. Uh, and I actually applied with like that background. Mm -hmm. When I got here, I rotated in uh, a lab uh, genomics. Mm -hmm. And I kind of fell in love with that, and I realized actually that at the moment, to the field of computational neuroscience is still a little like broad, mm -hmm. and to get the training to actually tackle those questions, I might have need to I might need training in a more specific and narrow field, mm -hmm. and so that's where uh, my switch actually to bioinformatics came in. Mm -hmm. But the bioinformatics is my training. The ultimate question though is still uh, MSA. Okay. So it's very quantitative work. Extremely, yeah. So it sounds like it's very much solitary work. Yes, yes, it, it tends to be. 
Okay, but you are very active in the MD PhD program. Yes, yeah. So how do you go from doing very solitary work to being um, a core fixture in the MD PhD program? Oh, that's very nice of you. Uh, I think uh, what you do in your PhD is essentially you're training for the future, but you also live in the present. And uh, if you are not around uh, and you're not interacting with people right now, then you're really uh, you're not really living up to the the whole ideal of like what a physician scientist is supposed to be. You're supposed to be there for your patients, but also for others. And the PhD training is long. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I'm on the shorter end, which is seven years, right. uh, which is still quite. Uh, long, but the tail can go longer, right. uh, and so you have to for each other and also be there for those coming behind you, because uh, I know when I entered the program, I this program is uh, I think one of the best programs because it's a, more of a family architecture where everybody feels connected, and I always knew I could talk to uh, the people above me and the years above me, and that really helped me uh, transition well. Mm -hmm. uh, to the city and to the program. And it's critical because there are so many transition points when you're an MD, PhD. So absolutely. You go from med school to PhD, from PhD to MD. Exactly. What do you do when your med school friends are graduating and you're still... Traditional endpoints don't exist in MD, PhD. Exactly. It's exactly. all one continuum. Exactly. And so getting through that continuum is dependent on the people around you. And so it's, in my view, it's the duty of any student to get their best training, but also make sure that everybody else has the best experience possible. So, wow. reaching so, out to others. Um, you've actually been uh, in a very rewarding situation because um, you're a big brother in the Gateways to Laboratory summer program we have for undergrads. Yeah. And uh, um, one of the students you recently mentored is now a first year MD PhD student yes. in our program. Camila Villasante. What was that like to have? A student you mentored when she was an undergrad know that she was applying and got accepted and is now matriculating in the program. So I, uh, I'm ecstatic that Camila's here. Uh, so to answer your question in two parts, when she was applying, I felt like I went from big brother to like dad <laughs> because I was, I was like so like, I, I think I uh, came to the office more frequently to see if I could <laughs> like divine based on the faces of you and Dr. Anderson what her status was than anybody else uh and uh get that away they, yeah Sorry. It, was, it, was, <laughs> uh, it was stone face so it was like reading tea leaves uh but when she got in uh, I was ecstatic because uh the gateways to the laboratory program is something that I like hold dear to my heart and it's a uh, so it's a program that really uh is life-changing because the students it targets uh Oftentimes, these are the same students who find out about MD PhD programs either too late or never. And they really bring a tremendous uh, contribution to the program. Uh, one of my classmates, uh, Ruth Martinez, is a Gateways alum. And I can name a few others, but you know, for time I won't, that uh, are truly magnificent MD PhDs. And so uh, having played a, a small role in that, uh, and seeing one of my uh, mentees matriculate to the program was truly rewarding. Yeah, it's a good yeah. feeling, right? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> All right, so you are uh, going to defend your PhD. Yes. You ready? Uh, in about a week, yes. I think I'll, yeah. I'll be almost there. What are you doing to prep? Uh, so prep, I'm uh, taking all the research that I've done, uh, so three years of research, uh, resulted in three basic science papers. No, yeah, three basic science wow. papers and uh, two clinical papers, so five in total. Uh, and I'm trying to condense all of that into an hour. So it's kind of a, a big task, but uh, I'll let you know when it's done, how, <laughs> how, how it happened. Well, we have a big bell here that you need to ring in the office oh, once yes. it's successful. So. Um, so what has been uh, some of the high points and maybe a low point throughout your training thus far? So I think throughout MD PhD training, I don't think there's a global high or a global mm -hmm. low. I think there is local high and local low. Okay. So 
for example, once you see your med student class graduate, that is a local blow. That's rough. It, it, it's rough because then you realize that you are a remnant class now. Uh, especially because when I joined the program, we were on something called the old curriculum. Yeah, exactly. And so coming back to med school, uh, not only is it new people, but it's a new way of thinking about Correct. medical education. And so when my class left, we were the uh, second to last class on that curriculum. I kind of uh, felt like a little sad, mm -hmm. but some of the highs were getting to know those people. Uh, further highs were getting to know other MD PhDs, especially my classmates. Uh, you know, I mentioned earlier, but it's really a, a feeling that I have. You know, I have uh, two families: my family and uh, by blood, and then the MD PhD family. Which you know, when you're when you're all in a pr the same program together for so long, you really do develop like friendships that like spawn into like brotherhood and sisterhood and sisters. Yeah, yeah. You guys are tight. Oh yeah, real well, tight. Well, maybe too tight. <laughs> we love the holiday cards that your class gives us every yeah, year. Yeah, we've been doing it for five years now. That's yeah. yeah I, I look forward to it every year. What are they going to come up with? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so um, you're going to start medical school about a month after yes. you defend. Um, you ready for that? That's a different mindset. Uh, so I have freaked out a little bit, but just as I mentioned, uh, the people above me when I started were there for me. They're there for me now. So specifically yesterday, mm -hmm. I talked to, uh, uh, her name is Jen Shia. She's also a Gateways alum. She is a Gateways alum. <laughs> uh, uh, so they're plugging Gateways. Uh, she is right now on uh, clerkships and right. she's took three hours out of her day wow. uh, to talk to me about upcoming clerkships. In fact, my clerkship schedule is identical to hers. Uh, wow. Because over the course of months, she's been kind of mentoring me on like how to re-enter med school. I've talked to various other people, uh, Corinne mm -hmm. uh, Kassif, who graduated, graduated the program. Uh, very, uh, she was very integral in like giving me the the background that I needed to like prepare for re-entry into med school. Has anyone that you asked for guidance um, not given you time? Not in this program, no. I think uh, at earlier points in my life, mm -hmm. potentially, but never through the MD-PhD program or through my uh, graduate mentors. Okay. And you said that you decided late to apply to yeah. MD PhD. Yeah. Has anyone um, tried to dissuade you from doing that? I got uniform dissuasion. Really? How so? Except for uh, one advisor. Uh, so I got the it's way too late. Uh, I got the your major is mostly math and computer science. Uh, in fact, when I applied to MD PhD program, I had one biology class taken. And it was evolutionary biology. Wow. Uh, so I actually uh, was kind of a little atypical in terms of the background that right. someone might have. Uh, and it was uniform dissuasion of don't do this. Uh, mostly, I feel, because there's a specific mold that people believe MD PhDs fall into. And if you don't exactly fit that mold, uh, the belief is that it's not for you. Uh, Do you think people in this program fit that mold? Uh, absolutely not. Yeah, I uh, think we pride ourselves in picking the atypical. Yeah, I can. <laughs> I mean, uh, I can think of a guy who majored in physics and a guy who majored in English literature right. just off the top of my head. Right, right, and they're both doing exceptionally well. Absolutely. Right, right. So, um, if you had to tell the next generation what they should do, what would that be? Uh, decide what you really want out of life. Mm -hmm and tune out the people who say you can't do it. Right. Just go for it. Right. If I listen to uh, the v virtual uniform dissuasion mm -hmm. of pursuing MD PhD, I wouldn't be here. Uh, and I had one mentor at my undergrad uh, who said, do it. Wow. And this mentor uh, uh, is one of the reasons why I'm here. Wow. Yeah. I hope you told the mentor that. Absolutely, she knows. What are some of the uh, biggest obstacles that you've had to overcome? Uh, I don't necessarily come from the uh, most wealthy background. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, I 
getting to the same level as uh, others mm -hmm. who might have that financial background uh, was a bit challenging. Uh, but realizing that how good you are is kind of a function of how hard you work. Mm. So if you imagine just a Cartesian graph with X and Y, where Y is essentially raw talent or you know how much privilege you're given at the beginning, some people are higher up mm -hmm. on the Y axis. Mm -hmm. You might be lower down on the Y axis. Mm -hmm. But you can intersect uh, that same axis or even surpass it based on how hard you work. And if X is time and Y is success, uh, the slope of that line is how hard you're going to go at it. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, th there's challenges that everybody faces. I faced some, uh, and I think my solution to it was just to pinpoint what I wanted to accomplish, mm -hmm. understand what was needed to get that goal, and then work as hard as possible. And tune out the naysayers, mm -hmm. and just kind of have an internal compass that pointed mm. towards what I wanted. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, you grew up in a traditional um, Hispanic American household. Yes. What was that like, and how did that um, help you in getting your so, dream? So it, it helped me tremendously in that I have a huge support network. Mm -hmm. uh, my parents are both my role models. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, I'm specifically Cuban and the Cuban and Latino like uh, philosophy is like you support one another mm -hmm. uh, and I, I definitely felt that through my family uh, and I've tried to like pass that on to mm -hmm. people who I interact with uh, whether my mentees or other people in the program uh, only ever see that as a benefit because mm -hmm. uh, coming from that background mm -hmm. uh, has helped me interact with uh, people on a multitude of levels. Mm -hmm. What else would you want to share, if anything? Uh, I think uh, that oftentimes when people think of applying for these programs, mm -hmm. uh, they're kind of frightened by the time commitment. Uh, I actually was petrified the first week I was here. I was, I realized I actually did the arithmetic for the first time <laughs> and I was like I'm gonna just be under 30 when I finish and I thought it was gonna I thought it was gonna feel like that and mm -hmm. I thought it was gonna be a struggle and for sure there is struggle along the way it is all right uh, it is a hard program but uh, the time flew and I don't think I could have made a better decision uh, coming here or pursuing MDPHC great would you be willing to talk to anyone who might have a similar background? Of um, course, absolutely. Great. All right. I think that's a characteristic of people here.